This is Deal, a town situated in the county of Kent. It lies on the English Channel, eight miles northeast of Dover. It has a small fishing community situated between Dover and the Isle of Thanet. Closely associated with Deal are the villages of Kingsdown and Warmer. Deal was named as one of the sink ports in 1278 and grew to become for a while the busiest port in England. Today, it enjoys the reputation of being a quiet seaside resort. The coast of France is approximately 25 miles from the town and is visible on clear days. The first pier appeared in 1838 and the original plans by engineer J. Rennie indicated that the structure was to be 445 feet long. A budget of 21,000 was awarded to the Deal Pier Company by the government to finance the project. After completing 250 foot of the main structure at a cost of £12,000, the company ran into financial difficulties and construction came to a halt. The unfinished pier was consequently opened and used as a docking point for steamers. Over the next 20 years, storms and sandworms played a major part in the decay of the structure and a large storm in 1857 threw the pier onto the beach where it was later sold as scrap for £50. In 1861, the Deal and Warmer Pier Company commissioned Eugenius Birch to design a new pier and work began in the spring of 1863. Stone from the ruined Sandown Castle, situated approximately one mile north from the pier, was used for the abutment and the pier itself was built of wrought iron and cast iron. The full length of the structure was 1100 foot long and included a three deck pier head and a steamer landing stage. Seating ran the full length and a tramway was provided for conveying goods and luggage whilst two attractive toll houses were built at the entrance. Deal Second Pier was officially opened on the 8th of November 1864 but the pier company once again discovered that they were unable to meet the full cost of the construction and the pier was handed over to the contractors. The addition of a pavilion on the pier head led to the pier becoming a popular venue for concerts as well as angling. On the 19th of January 1873, the Bark Marie hit the pier during a storm causing extensive damage. Repairs were carried out but on 26th of January 1884, the schooner Alliance also ran into the pier during a storm leading to further major repairs. Despite these two incidents, the pier remained a significant local amenity and it was purchased by Deal Council for £10,000 in 1920. Disaster struck with the coming of the Second World War when in 1940 the Dutch vessel Nora struck a fatal blow. Nora was anchored a mile offshore when a drifting magnetic mine struck the stern of the vessel. Damage was extensive and after evacuating the crew, the Nora was towed to the beach, 50 yards south of the pier. Local fishermen warned the authorities of the dangers that the vessel presented being left on the shore, but the warnings were left unheeded. Partially submerged, the rising tide lifted the Nora from the beach and continually smashed her against the pier. The old structure withstood the battering for some time but eventually the Nora was driven through the pier and brought some 200 foot of the wrought ironwork onto her decks. A visiting Winston Churchill surveyed the devastation and gave the army consent to demolish the broken pier to allow coastal guns and clear line of fire. All that was left were the toll houses on the foreshore. 
Strong local pressure came to bear after the war and in 1954 the old toll houses were removed and work began on Deal's third and existing pier. The new pier took three years to build and was formally opened by the Duke of Edinburgh on the 19th of November 1957. The pier was the first seaside pleasure pier of any size to be built since 1910 and was designed by Sir W. Halcrow and Partners. Constructed of reinforced concrete, the structure is 126 foot long and steel pies surrounded by a concrete case make up the main supports. The pier head originally had three levels, but a miscalculation of the tides has led to the lower deck being permanently covered by the sea. Deal Pier continues to be a significant local landmark and a public amenity. Now owned by Dover District Council, the pier has international recognition as an angling venue and the English breakfast served in the Pierhead Cafe have become an important feature of this typically British institution. In 1998, a 300 centimetre high bronze statue embracing the sea by sculptor John Buck was commissioned for the entrance to the pier. Suggestions for a fountain and water features had to be discarded because of the high maintenance and possibility of vandalism. The Deal Time Ball Tower is approximately 200 metres from the south of the pier. A Victorian maritime Greenwich Mean Time signal located on the roof of a waterfront four-storey tower. It was established in 1855 by the astronomer Royal George Biddle Airy. It was built by the Lambeth firm of engineers Morsley and Field. The time ball, which like the Greenwich time ball, fell at 1pm precisely and was triggered by an electrical signal directly from the Royal Observatory. Before it became a time ball tower, the tower was a semaphore tower used to signal to ships at anchor in the Downs or passing in the English Channel. From 1821 to 1831, the tower carried a semaphore mask which was used by the coast blockade for the suppression of smuggling to pass information along the coast. The blockade was under the support of the Navy and was manned by their personnel. The Time Ball Tower stands on the site of an earlier shutter telegraph, similar to this one. This was one of a chain of telegraph stations between the Admiralty in London and the Naval Yard at Deal. The telegraph line opened in 1796 and closed in 1814. Its purpose was to allow rapid communication between London and Deal the latter being an important naval anchorage during the Napoleonic Wars. In 1805, news of the naval victory at Trafalgar and the death of Nelson was brought to deal by the schooner HMS Pickle after calling at Falmouth and transmitted by the telegraph to the Admiralty in London. Following his victory at the Battle of Trafalgar, Horatio Nelson's body was preserved in a cask of brandy or rum to allow transport back to England. The pickled body was removed and upon inspection it was discovered that the sailors had drilled a hole in the bottom of the cask and drunk all the brandy or rum. We leave the Time Ball Tower and approximately 100 metres to the south we visit the small fishing community pulled up onto the shingle. Deal has never had a harbour, so the local fishing boats known as Deal Cutters were simply pulled up onto the beach. The boatmen of Deal cannot be excluded from any account of smuggling in Kent. Their seamanship was legendary, as was their shallow draft boats, Deal Luggers, and the 40 foot long galleys that held as many as 30 oarsmen and with a small sail could make the trip across to France in less than five hours. The shallow draft deal lugger could negotiate the shallows of the treacherous Goodwin Sands, where revenue cutters and Navy blockade ships could not hope to follow. The additional benefit of the galley 
was that if pursued, it was able to steer straight into a headwind, making it impossible for the sailing ships of that time to follow. It was also possible for a crew to carry a galley across the Goodwin Sands at low tide, also making it totally impossible for any revenue cutter to follow. The boatman also brought tea and other smuggled goods from a ship named the East Indiamen, which laid offshore in the early 19th century. They smuggled this by hiding the tea under their clothes in custom-made bags. They could slip up to £30 past the customs men. The boatmen were a law unto themselves and the looting and pirating of shipwrecks was a common practice. In the north end of Deal, many narrow streets link the seafront to Middle Street, which was ideal for the smugglers. They used secret tunnels and underground hiding places to hide their goods away, which they had plundered. Many of these tunnels remain hidden away, especially in the seafront conservation area. The Deal fishermen were probably a thorn in the side of the authorities for much longer than 180 years. On 14th of January 1784, acting on the direct orders of the then Prime Minister William Pitt the Younger, a troop of the 13th Light Dragoons moved in to deal from Sandwich. They were in great danger as it had been known that they were coming to deal and some 300 smugglers were waiting for them. Disaster was averted by the arrival of the 38th Foot who had forced march from Canterbury. There had been severe storms for some time and all the boats were pulled well up onto the beach. The troops were quartered on a farm for the night as no lodgings could be found from the people of Deal who had no liking for their unwelcome guests. The next day, the 15th, the troops moved down to the beach and smashed and set fire to the whole fleet of boats and luggers. The burning of the boats only gave the government forces temporary relief from the activities in Deal. Virtually opposite the fishing boats is Deal Castle, one of three. Deal Castle was built in 1539 to 1540 on Henry VIII's order as an artillery fortress, designed to allow all-round firepower from over 140 guns. Warmer and Sandown Castle were also built about the same time. These low squat fortresses were constructed in the shape of the Tudor Rose, having the central keep surrounded by circular bastions, which formed the petals. Sandown Castle was one mile northward from the pier, and notably only used as a prison for murderers. Colonel John Hutchinson, who had signed the death warrant of Charles I. In his memoirs, described by his wife, there is a harrowing description of the Colonel's pitiable existence from 1663 to 1664 in that appalling old ruined place. The Colonel was reduced to a childish occupation of sorting seashells. The castle remained in military use until 1863 and the old photo from then shows the castle before the upper levels were demolished. Further demolition work took place in 1882 and most of the surviving stonework was destroyed in 1893. Almost nothing now remains of the Sandown Castle. The sea started to breach the defences in 1785 but it was still used for another 50 years before being totally abandoned and the castle was left to the sea. It has now been covered in concrete to form part of the sea defences with just a few loose stones left behind to mark the spot. We leave the Deal Castle and proceed southward by 550 metres where we come to a memorial bandstand. In 1993, this bandstand was constructed here to mark the tragic loss of these young bandsmen and was built by public subscription on Warmer Green. On the east side of the bandstand, a plaque is placed on the fence with a quotation 
This bandstand is a memorial to 11 Royal Marines musicians killed by a terrorist bomb at Deal Barracks, 22nd of September 1989. On that fateful Friday morning, 22nd of September 1989, the Royal Marine School of Music at Walmer was bombed by the IRA, killing 11 members of the bandsmen and injuring a further 22 others. Hundreds of local people queued for hours in the sun the following day to give blood to help the wounded. Shortly afterwards, the service showed its gratitude by marching through the town behind the staff band with the empty spaces where the dead bandsmen would have normally been. annual summer concert given by the Marines Band on the Memorial Bandstand was a particularly moving event. It was a sad day for the people of Deal as well as for the Marines themselves when they were finally forced to move out of the barracks they had occupied for so long. For many months the local people had fought with the support of local MPs to keep our band at the school. A memorial garden was established, close to the site of the bombing, in the grounds of the former chapel and school. The School of Music is now being converted into luxury apartments. Sheep have recently been gazing on the field next to the church, where once the local people sat to enjoy concerts given by the band on a warm summer evening. We leave the bandstand and proceed to the lifeboat station, which is about 90 metres away. The station seen today was built in 1865. The lifeboat service goes back a long way and has a lot of history. Over 2,000 ships are believed to have been wrecked on the Goodwin Sands and the masts of several wrecks are visible from the shore at low tide. There have always been two lifeboats located at the joint towns of Deal and Warmer along the coast opposite the Sands. During World War I, Deal had two lifeboats, the Charles Dibdin and the Francis Forbes Barton. William Stanton was coxswain of the Francis Forbes Barton. In 1944, a bronze medal was awarded to coxswain Joseph Mercer for rescuing 13 men from an anti-submarine boat stranded on the Goodwin Sands. Warmer's last all-weather lifeboat was the Hampshire Rose. In 1964, an inshore lifeboat station was established with a D-class. The Hampshire Rose was retired from service on the 5th of May 1990 and with the addition of a B-class Atlantic 21 lifeboat for whose launching rig the boathouse was then extended in 1992. Warmer was permanently established as an inshore lifeboat station. A new Atlantic 21, James Burgess, was placed in service in 1992 and on the 22nd of January 1997 a new D-class lifeboat, Lord Kitchener, was placed in service. A new Atlantic 85 class lifeboat, Donald McLaughlin, was put on station in December 2006 along with a new D-class Dougie Rodbard. After the Second World War it was, for a time, one of the busiest lifeboat stations on our coast and Cox and Frederick Upton and motor mechanic C. Percy Cavill twice won medals for gallantry during those years. In both cases it was for services to foreign vessels. In January 1948, for rescuing 30 lives from the Italian steamer Silvia Onorato and in 1952 for rescuing the crew of 38 from the French steamer Argonne. The warmer lifeboat Charles Dibdin was one of 19 lifeboats which took part in the evacuation of the British force from Dunkirk in May 1940. 
The D-Class lifeboats are inflatable boats serving in the UK's inshore lifeboat fleet. Although they are the latest development of the D-Class lifeboat and as such are mainly referred to as a D-Class. This class of lifeboat is one of the smallest operated by the Lifeboat Institution and they are a common sight at lifeboat stations around the coast. Unlike other members of the inshore fleet, the D-Class does not have a rigid hull. All others, all weather lifeboat tenders, are rigid inflatable boats. These normally have a crew of three or four and is primarily used for surfer swimmer incidents as well as assisting in cliff incidents where the casualty is near the water. As of February 2020, the minimum crew for the D-Class was raised from two to three. The Seven Class is the largest lifeboat operated by the RNLI. Introduced to service in 1996, the class is named after the River Severn, the longest river in Great Britain. They are stationed at 35 locations around the coasts. This one is stationed at Dover. Practically near the lifeboat station are some well-kept flower beds on this section of land adjacent to Bank House. Deal has many floral displays dotted about. Some of the best displays can be seen near the pier. Window boxes on the pub, the King's Head and adjoining properties, as well as hanging baskets on the lampposts. Also, the roundabout accommodates flower beds with well kept floral arrangements. The area in front of the King's Head pub had a stunning display of flowers many years ago, but sadly it was removed and rebuilt as seen today. Although some effort has been made there with flowers in the wooded barrels, but undoubtedly does not replace the display that was once there. We leave the lifeboat station and continue southwards for another 260 metres to a memorial plaque on warmer seafront. This indicates the spot where Julius Caesar and his troops are believed to have first landed in Britain in August 55 BC. This invasion was not especially successful and was followed by a second much larger one the following year. Many historians believe the Roman army first set foot on British soil in 55 BC at Walmer. There was a second invasion in 54 BC, began at nearby Deal, both on the southeast coast, halfway between Ramsgate and Dover. Caesar spearheaded the Roman invasion of Britain, but mystery had surrounded where he landed. This is not the only possible landing place, but the most probable. The beach looks nice and calm now, but can you imagine what this was like then? We leave the Romans battling on the beach and journey southwards approximately three quarters of a mile to Warmer Castle, the last of the three castles in Deal. Warmer Castle was built in about 1539 by King Henry VIII in response to threats of an invasion from Europe. The castle was part of a 2.7 mile coastal barrier that included Deal and Sandown castles. The cannon shown would have been housed within the walls of the Walmer Castle, pointing out into the English Channel. This castle retains most of its original 16th century structure, with tall keep and 83 feet across at the centre. This was flanked by four rounded bastions. One of the bastions served as a gatehouse and a moat surrounded in turn by a curtain wall. Its curved walls are 15 feet thick. It was nearly identical to its sister castle at Sandown. 
The gardens of Warmer Castle date mainly from the 1790s and 1860s and comprise around 32 acres of land, split evenly between formal ornamental gardens and parkland. The main body of the gardens stretch away from the castle towards the northwest and is made up of protected well-drained chalk-based soil forming a maritime microclimate. By the mid 18th century the castle had become a well-equipped seaside retreat as well as a fort. Notable Lords Wardens include William Pitt the Younger, the Duke of Wellington and also the Queen Mother. The Duke of Wellington died at Warmer Castle in 1852. Lord Boyce was formally appointed Lord Warden of the Sinkports on the 10th of December 2004, succeeding Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, in that role. The Lord Warden was appointed by the Sovereign, but on taking office, took an oath before the representatives of the ports to uphold their ancient privileges, a tradition which continues to the present day. We now journey further south, to the village of Kingsdown, just under a mile. Kingsdown is a village immediately to the south of Warmer. Parts of the village are built on or behind the Shingle Beach that runs north to the Deal and beyond, while other parts are on the cliffs and hills inland. This lifeboat station was built in 1866 and was in operation until 1927. It is assumed to look like this as there are no photos available. The lifeboat station closed in 1927. It had five lifeboats in its 60 year history, saving 241 lives and has now become a private house. Jarvis Darnold was the coxswain of the Kingsdown lifeboat, Sabrina. A rumour has it that it was responsible for the removal of the property from the wreck of the north, which was wrecked on the Goodwin Sands. He was accused of plundering the lockers of the whole crew. Luckily, nothing followed this accusation. In 1872, Jarvis Darnold was still coxswain. He and his crew's average age of 55 years saved the lives of 31 crew and 14 lifeboatmen from Warmer who had been stranded on a sinking ship, the Sorrento. Kingsdown was also at the southern end of the important anchorage known as the Downs. In the late 19th century, the Downs was widely used by hundreds of sailing ships that needed to ride out bad weather although many ships came to grief on the good winds. In World War II, Kingsdown was the location for a secret radio transmitting ground station that provided a navigation system called OBO. It was designed to help aircraft locate themselves on operation over enemy occupied territory. Responders on a no-boat equipped aircraft rebroadcast signals being sent to them from two stations in the UK, codenamed Cat and Mouse. Signals were received back at the station and the distance to the aircraft measured on a large 12-inch CRT display. There are very little in the way of photos or where the location was of the transmitter station called Mouse. Sadly, there is not much to see. Located in Kingsdown Wood is the remains of the oboe. There are some photos of the concrete blocks for the antenna mast in these woods. It's assumed that the transmitter station was located here. It is also assumed that they used the same antenna that was used in Norfolk in Winterton, as seen here, called CAT. Even today, particular operational aspects of the system are still shrouded in mystery. On the last part of my journey of the coast, I will take a short drive to Old Stair Bay, approximately half a mile to the south. 
Within Old Stairs Bay and surrounding the Kent Downs is an area of outstanding natural beauty. This is a quiet secluded shingle beach situated just south of the small town of Kingsdown. There is not much history of this bay but has an interesting ghost story of the Blue Lady and this should not be confused with the Grey Lady of Oxney Bottom Woods which I will cover in part two of my journey of the countryside. It is believed that a woman dressed in blue is said to haunt this stretch of beach known as the Blue Lady of Romney Cod. She haunts the cliff path along Old Stairs Walk to Kingsdown House grounds looking for her lover. One legend tells that her lover was murdered by her father. She has been seen to vanish near a fence of Kingstown House which has now been demolished. Others who have seen this woman have reported how she bends to drink from a spring, suggesting she is rather at ease in her spiritual place. Yet the sighting that mentions how she moans as if in distress, no one has ever found out who this woman could be. We only know that she often visits the beach at the time of a shipwreck. I have now come to the end of my coastal journey. Next time I will visit the countryside and take you to Kingsdown Wood to see the bluebells, then see the combine harvesters at work. Then travel on to Oxney Bottom Wood with all its ghost stories and myths. Then continue to the Ringwald Windmill with its own secrets. Then journey on to Hawkshill Down which was used as an airdrome with its history. Finally we visit the village of Great Mundrum and spend some time in the church St Martin's for some Christmas carols. <laughs>